So my lesson this morning is going to be about benefits of a small church. So, benefits of us. Um, as we know, churches come in all sizes. We see from small um, couple people up to huge mega churches that good luck getting to know anybody in their congregation that huge. You can get see huge stadiums filled, or you can see just a couple people meeting in the house. Of course, we, as we know, we, we were actually some of those people, it was a small group meeting in a house at first, and now we have, we were able to have the opportunity to come into a building, and we have an even bigger opportunity now to continue to grow. So, as we take that in mind, with churches coming in all sizes, we can have, when you define what a small or big church is, now when I looked up some of these numbers and how people would define a small or a large church, even though that definition may be rather arbitrary, um, I actually saw one that says a small church is less than 200 members, <laughs> Woo. Um, which is about 80% of churches. Um, so we have a real small church, if we're going by those numbers. <laughs> Um, but even, you know, South Salem, I think we're like 180 there. They were so concerned that a small church. A medium church being anywhere from 201 to 400 members, which are about 10% of churches, and then a large church over 401 members, which is also about 10% of churches. I couldn't even imagine being in a church that was over 400 people. You just would not be able to, in my opinion, you wouldn't have the same effect as you would in a smaller congregation. And that is for a number of reasons, and those reasons are the things that we're going to talk about. So, of course, as we know, for me, and I'm sure for many of us, 200 people in a church is a rather large congregation. Mm -hmm. Especially when you hear them singing. That gets, that gets real loud. It gets, it's fantastic. But... Every size of a church, they have their advantages and they have their cons. So, you know, some advantages of a larger church, um, increased resources. Um, just bottom line, you have a bigger building, you have more money, you have a number of things that you're not going to have as a small congregation. But the benefits um, of small churches um, are often lost in the larger churches. And one of my big ones that I always see there is connecting with people. Um, when you start to get in larger congregations, you start to know less people. Um, so your community, even though it seems and appears large, it does not mean that you know pretty much anyone sitting around you. And that can change every week. So the purpose of this lesson is not to encourage that stagnation that you find in so many churches and church growth. But we need to be reminded of the benefits that we have and obligations of a small church. So one benefit is stronger sense of family. Matt, do a great job with you. <laughs> a small church is one where almost everyone knows each other. Um, we've all known each other for a while. Um, of course, we know we knew each other from a different congregation. And then also families meeting up and you know having different events and stuff together, which is great. We will come to a point where we're not going to know some of the people potentially coming in, which I think is also great. Um, we're able to be able to bring those people into our own family. But you're going to have a stronger sense because you know everybody. You don't just know them by saying hi in the hallway. Um, you actually get to know someone for who they are and what they struggle with because I feel like that is something that is left behind in so many gigantic churches is people can be so scared and tempted especially in a larger group of people to come to somebody else and say hey I have these things going on I have this problem I have you know these things like you may have more people praying for you in a larger congregation but to others, a lot of people that are afraid to go up in front of 
larger group of people. So that benefit, a stronger sense of family, that face-to-face -face interaction is so much easier. And I'm not going to say it's easier for everybody because some people just don't like talking to other people about their things um, or things that are going on, but it makes it easier for especially the stronger Christian to come up to that person and say, hey, how are you? What can I pray for you for? How can I support you? What are the things going on? What do you want to learn? Do you want to have Bible study? Um, so those have strong benefits. So even when we don't remember their names, because I'm sure we all struggle with, you know, remembering people's names, and I'm not going to say it's an age thing. Um, <laughs> plenty of young people I know, that I couldn't tell you. Like, I know your face. Okay, David. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, me and David have struggled with this for a while. Um, <laughs> so, I, I always remember a face, though. Um, especially for me, like, working in healthcare. Like, you can say someone's name all day, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. You tell me a room number or what they look like, I know who you're talking about. Um, so, getting to actually be more personal with people, I think, is such a strong benefit in a smaller congregation. And it's easier to develop those familial relationships with people. Because it's easier just to talk. People aren't as intimidated by everything that's going on. And, like I said, everyone is going to vary in that. Um, they still might be intimidated if they have a harder past. That they, you know, they may hear something in the lesson where they have questions. And it's up to us to answer those questions. Or they may have something that's like, oh man, I don't know if I can be here because I've done in my past, or these things. It's always our responsibility to make them feel at home, to make them feel like family, to build that familiar relationship with somebody. And it's a lot harder to do in a large congregation because you could potentially have, you know, 300 other people there, 400, 500, stadium. Um, in that sense, in my own personal opinion, I always have said the bigger the church building, more often than not, the bigger struggles you have and the more that they have put towards material things instead of connecting with the people with them. A lot of those churches have ways that they're bringing people in either through entertainment or false doctrine. Um, and it's hard, especially when we look at a lot of the big congregations, because they have these strong preachers, which they call themselves pastors, but we know a pastor is an elder and not a preacher. But you have so many of these people that know the truth, yet refuse to teach it because it's not making them money. Um, and I won't name drop but one, um, Billy Graham is a huge one. That man knows his Bible from front to end, and he has said in an interview that he knows the truth, but he won't teach it because it will take people away from his church. Um, and so when you think about the word sense of family, which is proper, let's look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 through 2. 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 through 2. It says, Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. So, when we have that sense of family, we're looking at those, those older men as like our fathers, or our younger men as brothers. I always say you're my brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all family. And I've even, you know, my daughters have said this multiple times. Well, well they're our family. They're our church family. Um, so even if it's not blood, we know our spiritual. We know who our spiritual family is. And so, when we are developing these relationships with other people in this smaller um, congregation, we have an opportunity to cross generational lines. And. When, you, when I'm talking about generational lines, I'm talking about, so like, father and their kids, um, mother and their daughters, sons, and then eventually their kids also. So we have that opportunity 
to have multiple generations in your congregation. And this would be where young and old can also benefit from each other's strengths. But it's also where we're going to see each other's weaknesses. And it gives us the ability to encourage one another and to build on those things. So the family of God, as we know, is a wonderful blessing to us. A blessing most often experienced in the smaller congregations, smaller churches. In Mark 10, 28 through 30, it says on the next slide, Peter began to say to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I truly say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. We will get tenfold in our families. We are to have no fear because we are given eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Another benefit of a smaller church is that opportunity to grow. In a large church, you're going to grow, but are we going to see the growth? Because you already have, let's say, four or five hundred people in there. Are you going to notice one, ten, forty, fifty? I mean, at that point, it's, you're just seeing potentially different faces. You might not ever see one person in that entire church. You might not even know they go there. But in a smaller church, you're going to see those people. You're going to see that growth. And when you have the opportunity to grow, you're going to see that, especially smaller congregations, we are needed. Mm -hmm. We are needed in our communities because we are going to be able to have that more familiar relationship with people. And when people see that and when they feel welcomed coming into a congregation and they feel like they're part of a family and a bigger bigger thing, a bigger opportunity, they have the opportunity for growth, they are going to want to stay there because they feel at home there. The roles to fulfill are not that much different between large and small churches. We know that. There are different things in churches that we have to fill. Preacher, song leader, and I'm not going to say even a, necessarily a paid preacher, um, or people who are paid, because everyone can song lead. Yes, everyone can song lead. Um, everyone can preach. Not everyone can be an elder. Not everyone can be a deacon. So those are roles and things that we would have to fill throughout our congregation and looking biblically. But anyone who has the ability to teach or to get up in front of people and preach God's word, even do the Lord's Supper, give a prayer. Those are all things that we will have in a church. And I feel like, especially in a smaller congregation like we have, right now we have three men. You don't get the option. <laughs> you're preaching, you're teaching in some way, you're doing the Lord's Supper, you're praying, you're teaching a class. But that can also be such a good thing for congregations because it gets you into the word more. It gets you thinking about things throughout the week. It allows you to come forward and be the leader that we are called to be as men. So when we are doing these things, whether large or small, the number of preachers, song leaders, it doesn't matter. They're about the same because you need the people in those positions. We may not have backups here. Um, we do. It, what it really does for us in a smaller congregation is it says, one of us isn't here, you're just doing a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but we're willing to do that because that's what needs to be done. That is our role in the church. The ratio 
when you're talking about small and large, um, is usually much greater in small churches, as we know. Um, just simply because we don't have that larger number to, to choose from. So it's it's three of us, and when it's not three of us, it's two of us. And if it's not two of us, it's one person doing all the, all the rules. So we have a greater need in smaller churches, especially for more men and women for different classes. Um, because in our congregation, as we know, we have more kids than two adults, which is wonderful. Um, but it does call for more teachers. So it's also more likely in a smaller congregation that we are used for our calling. And if we think we have a gift, or maybe you're unsure, I think I can do that, I think I can do this, do it. Come out of your comfort zone. Just come forward and say, hey, I think I can do this. The best way to learn something is by doing. Um, whereas your larger churches have a gigantic rotation of people. Even when we were up in South Salem, there was a large rotation of teachers in and out. And people, you know, doing Bible class. And, you know, people doing, like, Lord's Supper set up and you name it. Just the roles all just changed because you had a bigger rotation. Which, in some ways, can be nice in a way that, like, if somebody is, has been doing something for a very long time. And they're like, well, something came up, you know, in my life. Or, like, you know, these things I might not be able to do this for a little bit then they have that option to be like, okay, well, this person can fill in for a little while. Um, but in a smaller congregation, I believe that it's, when you have that role, it gives you that greater sense of purpose in a congregation. And when you have that greater sense of purpose in your congregation, in your church community, it, it gives you that feeling of giving. And we know that we always feel so much better when we give rather than when we receive. We also have a greater opportunity to preach and serve in public worship. You don't get that in large churches. Um, and, you know, the opportunities may only come up every once in a while in a larger congregation. And so you see, actually, you may... You don't want to see stagnation in a smaller church to grow, but often you'll see stagnation in people serving in large congregations because they're not able to consistently do it. And so they're like, ah, I barely ever do it anyway, so I'm not going to do it this time. Or, you know, so-and-so can do it. So you're, it's easier to put, those, put that off. So we know as a small church, the roles, especially that we have as men, it's a necessity for us. There is no choice. But was that out of design through Christ? Who says, okay, we're starting a church. We have these men here, and they're willing to serve. That was something that he put in front of us on purpose. And it's also where we can find ourselves to be what we call that those training grounds for young men. Those training grounds that we can continue to seek the Lord, and whether that be out of necessity or not, the more you put yourself into it, the more you're going to learn and the more easily you're going to be able to preach and teach to people. So, in a smaller congregation, it's also, you're going to see that you're missed more. Because when somebody's not here, part of that congregation is not there. Especially, you know, as a man in a smaller congregation, you're going to know, you're going to be missed because that person is going to be doing more. Um, and so you're going to notice that more, and you're not going to notice that in a big church. So, you know, it can be several weeks in a larger church before... Uh, anyone even notices that you weren't there. And I, I think the family side of that just gets really lost. And in a larger church, we are called to encourage one another. But in a big church, how often are you passed over? How often are you missed for your, with your encouragement? 
In a small church, you're going to be able to give that encouragement and that support and see what's wrong with people and be there to just be with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, it's, it can be easy to get lost in a crowd of large people. But, in a smaller congregation, if we aren't if we are starting to show signs of weakness as a Christian, who is going to notice that in a big congregation? Maybe you're close people, but in a small congregation, you're going to see it. And we can read about that in Galatians 6, verse 1 through 2. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. Where it says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need to be able to bear each other's burdens. And you, it's very hard to do in a larger congregation of people. So, proportionally speaking... There are more preachers, teachers, elders, and average members have been developed by small churches than through large churches. But there are many things a large church can do that a small church cannot. But small churches, they do have a lot of those benefits that we need to appreciate. And they also have those obligations. So the obligations that we would see in a small church is that nurturing sense of family. So congregationally, um, when we are providing opportunities for spiritual fellowship, we need to know that that is nourishing us as Christians. Whether that be Bible classes, gospel meetings, singings, um, encouraging the weak, being there for um, the sick, uh, visiting widows, um, going out to the community, and then we individually, we have the opportunity for a hospitality. Um, so inviting others to your homes, out to lunch, um, potlucks. I'll tell you right now, I've never seen a potluck in a church 400 plus <laughs> without it being a gigantic like outing. Um, yes, I know like you'll see like Bible camps and like huge oh. things, but. In a big church, could you imagine inviting 50 people out to lunch? <laughs> like, I can't even eat food 20 people out to lunch. So, when we really think about the sense of family and that, that nourishment and that of our soul that we get from that smaller congregation, there is such a benefit for us to be able to continue to grow in Christ and grow in our congregation. And as we seek to nurture that sense of family, we can't limit our efforts to those in our physical families. So, luckily for all of us, we're all a physical family as well as a spiritual family. Yeah. Um, which is a benefit. But we also can't allow, when we start to grow, other people that um, nurturing that sense of family with other Christians, we can't let that overtake our own relationships and our own spiritual relationships with our physical family. And that can be so easy to do because you're so excited to grow and you're so excited to talk to other people and you forget, hey, your son's struggling. Your daughter's struggling. Your wife is struggling. Your husband's struggling. Are we missing that because we're thinking, oh, well, I'm I'm helping this person grow, I'm helping this person with this, or I'm doing all these things, this is great, and you miss what's right in front of you. So, that is something that is such a benefit that we have for in a small congregation. But I feel like that can also be missed sometimes in a small congregation. Because we're so excited to teach a lesson, or teach a class, or have Bible study with somebody else and we don't do it with our own family. 
because it's easy to get distracted and it's just every day, you know? So the biggest thing I would say in a small congregation is it provides a huge opportunity for growth and training those willing to learn and to serve. Um, we were all young men, especially at one point. I remember I was young and I was like, oh, I don't want to stand in front of a group of people. And I'll, just, I'll just help serve the Lord's Supper on the end, I'll be the end guy. I don't have to say any prayers, I don't have to lead it. <laughs> I just have to know where the trays are going. Um, but it still is, even as a young man, it makes you feel like, okay, I serve, you know? It made you feel good about yourself. Um, men's classes, ladies' classes, how to be a stronger man, how to lead in your family, how to be a strong woman, how to help, you know, encourage the younger women in a congregation, as well as how to, you know, treat husbands and kids and, you know, like where your roles are as men and ladies in congregations. And we have to be able to utilize those willing to develop in a small church. Um, it provides opportunities for men willing to preach, lead singing, and likewise for women willing to teach children and other women. We should not feel that a preacher is just shirking his duties when he opens his pulpit or Bible classes so others can grow through such experiences. And I feel like there's many people that even I've met, they're like, well, I don't know if I want someone else to preach up here. Because this is where I preach. You know, or like, Oh, well, why is he allowing these people to preach? What is he got something going on? Or like, does he just not want to preach this week? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I'm giving people the opportunity to grow themselves, and those who are willing to learn. Um, in that sense, the sense where a preacher is like, no, this is my pulpit, that's a whole different story. Um, that's not growth. In fact, that's, that's part of stagnation that can happen in churches. Um, so we learned about that actually in 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 2. 2 Timothy 2, 2. Where Paul says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men. So we have to be able to gives those opportunities to these faithful men to preach, you know, what Paul has taught us and what the gospel has taught us in general. And I think there is a point there, too, especially in a smaller congregation, and it can even happen in a large congregation. Are faithful men preaching? Because often we see, and it can happen in any style, any size church, if we hear something that is not biblical, and we hear somebody that is giving false teaching out to people, it is easier in a small congregation to come and confront that person and deal with it that way. Where in a large church, it is a lot harder unless there is a very large group of you that say, no, your teaching is incorrect. Your teaching is wrong. This should not be happening up here. And I believe that's also the job of the elders, but there are so many times that I know a lot of us have even seen you'll you'll have elders as the years go on just like, well no, that's fine. No, that's okay. And they just slowly, slowly let more things in. And then it's up to the people to say, No, we're not this isn't biblical. You need to, you know, come to them with these issues and like I said, it's a lot easier to do that in a smaller church. Because you are more familiar with somebody. Another thing we need to do is we need to watch for stagnation. It is tempting to want to remain small. Some people just don't like a lot of people. Um, whether that be from anxiety or it's just, you know, too much going on. Um, and this could be the advantage of a small congregation, or, you know, the warmth, the friendliness, you name it. The Lord, though, expects us to